everyone. My name is Carrie Elvey. I'm the Senior Naturalist at the Wilderness Center, and this is the Spring Wildflowers Program being recorded for North Branch of the Stark Library. So today we're going to talk about 20 of our common uh, and really interesting wildflowers that are blooming right now in the midst of spring. And so we'll jump right in and talk about each of these. Uh, this is the first spring wildflower. Skunk cabbage is uh, perhaps not on the top of everyone's favorite wildflowers. It's not a beautiful flower. You wouldn't put this in a vase and take them to your mother on Mother's Day, um, but a really fascinating flower. And the first wildflower that blooms in the spring here in Ohio. And skunk cabbage is this spathe and spadix kind of flower. And if you look at the yellow inside, inside this red turned up um, spathe, uh, the flower itself gets really hot. And so it creates its own heat. And it can be several degrees warmer than the outside air inside that flower. And so the combination of warmth and stink makes this plant really attractive to early, early pollinators like flies. And so this is a wetland plant. Um, again, maybe not one that you would put in your picked flower arrangement, uh, but definitely a great plant to get out and look at. And it will even melt the snow around it. So you can go look for this spring wildflower while snow is still on the ground. This is another one of our really, really early blooming plants. Early, um, starting in March, you can see this plant. It's named Colt's Foot, and it got its name for the shape of the leaf. So the leaf itself resembles a big Colt's Foot. The ground up leaves were used as a cough remedy by early settlers, sometimes called colt's foot um, or cough wart. Um, so you'll see the yellow flowers uh, before you see any of the leaves and it's often a roadside ditch kind of flower. This is rue anemone. This is one that's becoming really common for people to plant in their backyards. Uh, tea made from the root of this was used for vomiting and for diarrhea. Um, but like a lot of our early spring wildflowers, uh, rue anemone is making pollen more than nectar. Um, and so nectar takes a lot of energy to make. Um, there's some evidence that this plant um, may be making a little bit of nectar, but it's really relying on pollen um, as an enticement to the flower visitors. Um, and that saves this plant a lot of energy really early in the season. This is hepatica. Uh, the name comes from the Greek word meaning liver, um, and it's in reference to the shape of the leaf. And so there's this really interesting idea called the doctrine of signatures um, that was really popular when a lot of these plants were getting their names um, in Linnaeus's day. And so the doctrine of signatures says that plants will tell us what they're good for because of how they look. So in this case, um, the leaves are shaped like the lobes of a liver. Therefore, this plant must be really good um, to treat liver problems. And so it was used as a liver cure. Um, not proven to be effective, most of these Doctrine of Signatures plants, um, but certainly that's how their cures were based um, on how a plant looked. This is the quintessential spring wildflower, spring beauty. It's tiny, about the size of your thumbnail. Um, the tubers can be eaten. They're like potatoes, but way, way, way smaller. Um, the flowers follow the sun. They only open up when the sun is shining. And uh, those stripes that you can see, those pale pink stripes, are basically airline landing strips for the pollinators. And so many, many plants have these kind of nectar guides, um, stripes or circles or some sort of mark that show uh, insects that can see in UV color um, when, not only when the pollen is ripe, but how to find it. And so this is a slightly older flower. You can see the, the stripes are darker. This plant has pink pollen. And so you get these bees that pollinate spring beauties and get covered in this pretty pink pollen. Um, this is a very special bee. This is the spring beauty bee, and it feeds almost exclusively on spring beauty. Um, so there's a very, very close relationship there. This is also a type of mining bee, and mining bees are the ones that are digging holes in the ground. And so one of the best things you can do for bees in your backyard 
besides the usual things of not using pesticides and planting lots of pollinators, is to leave some bare ground. Don't heavily mulch everything because um, these bees need bare ground to go in and to lay their nests. Um, and who doesn't want beautiful pink pollen color covered bees uh, roaming around their yards? These are bluebells. Bluebells uh, are pink when they open and uh, when they first open and then they turn this beautiful soft blue. And in the Victorian language of flowers, uh, bluebell stood for humility. And so in the Victorian language of flowers, uh, different plants um, had different meanings. And when you put a bouquet together, you had to make sure you put the right plants um, to send the right message. Um, blue, blue bells also are called Virginia cowslip. Um, and so before you picture tutu-clad heifers tiptoeing through the tulips, um, you should know that cow slip is actually the American, early American word for cow patty. So the bluebells were often found in the same moist soils that farmers were turning over into pasture land. Therefore, cowbells, cowslips were found in areas where cowslips would eventually be deposited by the cows in the pasture land. This is bloodroot. This is one of my very favorite spring wildflowers um, because I found out really early on um, as a child that it, the roots bled red. That's how it got its name. When you snap the root of this plant, there's a red juice that comes out. And that red juice was used um, by early American Indians for uh, dyeing cloth, for paint, and for insect repellent. And there's a chemical that comes from this plant, an extract from the plant, called sanguinarine, or sanguinarine, uh, and it prevents plaque. And you, so if you look at your toothpaste tube and you see sanguinaria or sanguinarine, um, it came from this spring wildflower. The other really interesting thing, if you look at the picture on the right, after the flower has bloomed, you get these tiny little pointy seed heads. And inside these seed heads are these really snotty looking seeds, tiny brown seeds, with um, these blobs of snot attached to them. And those blobs of snot, snot serve a really important purpose. They are food and attractants for ants. So ants will go to these seeds, they will eat, start to eat this really protein rich snot and they will carry those seeds with the snot attached back to their colonies. And along the way, some seeds will drop, some will get buried in the colony, um, but these seeds are dispersed by ants and um, tempted to do that by these really protein rich snot blobs. These are common blue violets. Um, blue violets, all of the violets, spread by horizontal stems. So they make nice carpets in woodlands or in yards. There's about 80 species of violets in the United States and their leaves are really rich in vitamin A and C. Uh, about five times more vitamin C than an orange. So a lot of vitamin C. And the flowers are edible too. A lot of people will sugar these dipped in um, egg white and then dipped in sugar and used to decorate cakes or um, tea sandwiches. Um, becoming more and more popular again is violet jelly, which is made again from the flowers with lots of sugar um, and pectin. Um, there's also a lot of butterfly species that really need this, uh, this species. And so a really great plant to have. It will also make a nice carpet or ground cover in your yard if you're looking for a plant that will spread around. Dandelion is a spring wildflower. It's not a native spring wildflower. It's introduced um, and many, many people consider this a pest. But dandelion is a really important plant. Um, the leaves are edible and super nutritious. The root makes a great coffee substitute. And we actually import about 100,000 pounds of dandelion root every year um, to be used by pharmacists and they turn it into tonics um, and liver medicines. And so we're actually, even though we have plenty of dandelion growing here in the United States, it's an agricultural product and other parts of the world and we are importing a lot of it. It's also a really important pollinator plant early in the season. Um, and a lot of um, pollinator groups are promoting something called no mow May, where they are asking people to not mow their lawns uh, in May to make sure that the pollinators have a good healthy start. 
Uh, a lot of us this year haven't been able to mow in May, so we're all um, participating in that campaign whether we wanted to or not. This is another fun plan. This is Go Over the Ground. It's also introduced. Uh, it was used to brew beer and ale. Um, got replaced by hops in the, sometime around the 16th century. Um, but in the early days of beer brewing, this is, this is what was used. It has a real um, hayy scent to it. It also has a ton of different names, ground ivy, um, robin's egg, all sorts of names. And I like this plant because when you look really closely at a flower, they look like little animals, maybe a hippo or a cow with droopy ears. Um, and if you don't see that, maybe adding eyes on will help or maybe adding a nose on will help. So look closely if you have this plant, you probably have it in your yard um, growing and um, see if you can see the little animal faces in this one. This is garlic mustard. Again, not um, something we would like to see, but we often do. This is not only introduced, it's invasive. It's a type of mustard. Uh, it was introduced because it's edible. It makes great pesto. It's great in salsa. Uh, it's great with lamb. Um, but incredibly invasive. So not only does it compete for space and sunlight um, and outshade and outcompete other plants because it grows so fast, it also produces chemicals that deter other plants. So it's actually poisoning the soil um, for many other plants. The other problem with this plant is that it's a sink for West Virginia white. The West Virginia white is a butterfly uh, related to things like the cabbage white butterfly, um, but a native threatened species. And um, these West Virginia whites will lay their eggs on mustards, but they don't uh, differentiate between the different mustards. We have lots of native mustard plants. Um, so if they lay their eggs in garlic mustard, um, which is easy to find a big patch of garlic mustard. The eggs will hatch, but the caterpillars can't survive on the garlic mustard. And so um, all the caterpillars will die. So a terrible plant for that reason. So it should definitely be pulled and controlled wherever possible. This plant is bed straw or cleavers. This one's a lot of fun when we have groups at the center, we can pick a piece of this and give it to the teacher to wear as a corsage to show how sticky it is. Uh, it smells really sweetly, kind of like a sweet straw smell to it. Tiny white flowers. It was used to stuff bed mattresses in the early colonial days, um, which makes a lot of sense. Not only does it stick together so it stays uh, loftier or fluffier, um, but the chemical smell of it uh, also would deter lice and fleas and things like that. This is our Ohio's official state wildflower, the Ohio trillium, large flowered trillium. Three petals, three sepals, three leaves. Um, root tea again from this plant used for cramps and uh, easing the pain of childbirth by, by the early American Indians. Um, beautiful, beautiful flower, spreads fairly quickly, although it takes individual plants a long time to mature, several years to mature. You often see in Ohio large patches of this that will cover an entire hillside. Um, so an aptly chosen Ohio State wildflower. This is another one of our weird ones. This is Jack in the Pulpit. Um, different type of flower than most. Um, that's how it got its name. It looks supposed to look like a little preacher man standing in his pulpit. Um, all of the plant, the entire plant makes calcium oxalate crystals, which will cause this really awful burning if it's eaten raw. So supposedly, um, supposedly, this uh, rite of passage amongst American Indians and early settlers was for the boys to eat a bite of this root and to not complain while they were eating it. Now, whether that's true or not, um, is up for debate, um, but certainly not a plant that you would want to eat, um, certainly wouldn't taste good, um, but that's not what really makes this plant weird. This plant can change sex depending on the conditions of the environment. It's one of very few plants that can do that. And so uh, Jack in the pulpit, um, when conditions are really tough, so when there's um, leaner years, uh, not as many nutrients, drought, whatever, this plant is typically male. And when it has stored up enough energy, so it may be male for several years to store up enough energy, when it's done that, it becomes a female the next year and will produce fruits um, because that takes so much more energy. So depending on the conditions, it can decide whether it's going to be male or female. 
This is the May apple or umbrella plant. Um, really noticeable plant. The leaves stay out all summer. Um, the flowers are short-lived, but the, the leaves themselves are out all summer. Later in the summer, they start to get yellow, um, looks like rust spots on them. Um, so really noticeable as you're taking a, taking a walk in the woods. This one has some really interesting animal um, symbiotic relationships. There's a moth called a slant-lined moth. Um, it's just a white moth um, that hides in overnight, over winters, or over spends the nighttime, not winter, but overnight, in the flower. And it looks exactly like one of the petals of a flower. And so it gets really good camouflage over a safe place to spend the night. And as it's leaving, presumably it picks up a little bit of pollen. May apples don't make nectar. So they um, need to be cross pollinated, but they don't really do anything um, to attract pollinators. It's more accidental pollination by things like this moth or by um, bumblebees that are feeding on uh, local other blooming plants that do have nectar. The other really interesting relationship is that this plant really needs eastern box turtles. Um, so box turtles are the only known vertebrates that feed readily on fruit of may apple. Uh, humans can eat may apple when it's ripe, but the rest of the time it's poisonous. Um, so a fruit that falls on the ground can germinate. Um, they found that germination rates increase 90% if they pass through the gut, through the digestive tract of a box turtle. So if a box turtle eats your flower and your, or the, your fruit and your may apple, you have a 90% better chance of having those seeds um, dispersed and grow. This is blue-eyed Mary. This is a taller, most of our uh, spring wildflowers tend to be fairly short. Blue-eyed Mary gets taller has these beautiful blue and white flowers. And blue and white flowers are generally an indication that this is a plant that's pollinated by bees. And so bees really see blue and white color best. Um, and many, many bee pollinated plants have these irregular shaped flowers and a landing platform. So you can see on this one, the bee is about to land on the platform and then it can crawl down inside the flower to get, the, to, get to the nectar. We added wild blue phlox because this is a plant that many people are familiar with because they grow it in their garden. So this is related to garden phlox, um, but the wild phlox only comes in blue. It doesn't come in all the other colors. And uh, if you see, it has five petals. There's a lookalike plant called Dame's Rocket that you often see covering on um, sort of ditch hillsides. Uh, that has only four flowers. Everyone around here calls that plant phlox. Um, but it's actually Dame's Rocket and is a mustard, um, not the pretty blue wild phlox. Now we have two plants that are pollinated not by bees or butterflies, but by hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds have, of course, the long beak with an even longer tongue. And this plant is made to um, cater to hummingbirds. So as a hummingbird flies up to this plant and sticks its long tongue uh, into the tips of those flowers, the point that the top the pointing part, um, there's lots of nectar in there. Bumblebees tongues aren't long enough to reach in there to get the nectar, but they have found out that they can chew through those little spurs, um, pierce the spur and drink the nectar. So they sort of cheat the system. Um, this plant, uh, the seeds used to be dried and rubbed into the hair to control lice um, and other, other ickies that would get into your hair. Um, so uh, if you have wildlife well, like columbine, um, watch for hummingbirds, but also watch for bees chewing into those little spurs. This is our other hummingbird pollinated plant, the cardinal flower. And uh, American naturalist John Burroughs, he said, it is not so much something colored as color itself. And that cardinal flower is a heartthrob of color on the bosom of dark solitude. This is an incredibly striking plant. Um, beautiful, beautiful bright red, which is what hummingbirds see. And again, hummingbirds have to fly up to this plant and stick their long tongue deep into the tube to get to the nectar. And in this plant, you can see inside that circle, that's where the nectar is. So imagine a hummingbird's head coming up, that, that pollen is hitting the top of the hummingbird's head and coating the top of the hummingbird's head as it probes for nectar. 
And then our last plant um, has the grossest names. This is Ohio spiderwort, um, also called widow's tears, which isn't so gross, but also snotweed and cow slobbers. Um, and it got those names, cow slobbers, snotweeds, widow tears, because the flowers themselves turn to snot. Um, instead of drying and falling off, they actually just turn to snot. We don't know exactly why that is, but we know that other plants um, that have these really um, snotty kinds of sap, uh, it's an insect deterrent. Um, because as insects chew on that, it gums up their mouth parts and they can't, they can't continue to eat. Um, this flower got its Latin name, um, Linnaeus named it after two gardeners, who the um, Trandescants, who were um, the gardeners to King Charles I of England, and they had come over to America, seen this plant, taken it back, um, and today it's a really, really common plant in most English cottage gardens. It fits that style of gardening so well. Um, one, at one point in time, thanks to the doctrine of signatures, it was thought to cure the bites of spiders because these bracts hanging under the flower look like spider legs. Um, but probably the most interesting thing about this plant is that botanists noticed that the blue blossoms turn pink in the presence of radiation or other really severe um, pollutants. And as on further study, they found that uh, mutations in the cells of this plant directly correlate to the level of pollution. So it's like our little own mini Geiger counters, um, pollution watchdogs living in our own backyards. So if you um, live next to a nuclear power plant and want to have your own little Geiger counter, plant Ohio spiderwort. So we, I hope you enjoyed learning some quick facts about these spring wildflowers. One of the really wonderful things about Ohio in our springtime is that we have this whole host of wildflowers and lots of places in Ohio to get out um, and see them. Lots of places like the Wilderness Center all over Ohio where you can go hiking and see these wildflowers. And after winter's been long and dark and gray, these flowers really offer um, little rays of, of colorful sunshine uh, to us in hope of spring coming. And even more importantly than that, they're really important sources of, of nectar and of pollen um, for these early flying insects. So if you wanna learn more about using these kinds of wildflowers in your own landscape, by all means, check out the Wilderness Center's um, Backyard Habitat Initiative, um, come to one of our native plant sales, stop by the center um, in the nature store and buy some native plants. Um, start to add them into your, your own gardens. Um, thank you so much for joining the library and joining the Wilderness Center. Um, and uh, get out while we still can in, in um, this spring and take a look at these wildflowers while they're still blooming. Thanks so much.